Hello and welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show is the first in a five-part series on open banking. So why do I need a five-part series on open banking? Open banking is probably the biggest trend or topic matter of interest across the world right now in traditional banking circles. And I think, frankly, there is a very poor understanding of not only what it means, but also what's been done to date and what positives and negatives basically are going to potentially come out of open banking. And what I wanted to do was help create a piece of education or a series that basically helped educate people on how open banking's worked out around the world. And I'm happy and lucky enough to have a large enough network that we can afford to take the time to do different podcasts around different geographical regions. So the first podcast today is specifically focusing on the world leaders in open banking, in my opinion, which is the European Union. So to help me unpack what open banking means in the Euro European Union and just general thoughts on open banking, I brought back Daniel Dilderlein from Alca, who was previously on the podcast, and I'm introducing you to Jesus Inoma of Grant Thornton. And they are both experts in this field, and we had a lively and amusing conversation that I hope you will enjoy. And with that, here's my interview with Daniel and Jesus. Daniel and Jesus, thank you for taking the time today. Uh, thanks for the invite, Jason. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, my pleasure. So uh, I'm going to let you both introduce yourselves uh, briefly. We'll start with the uh, the recurring guest to the show now. So Daniel Doderline, a uh, little bit about who is you, who you are, what it is you do, and your involvement in open banking. Hey, Jason. Uh, thanks for having me. So yeah, Daniel Doderline uh, from Norway. I'm a serial entrepreneur, uh, created one of the first fintechs out of the Nordics. Uh, today, I'm the CEO of Settle Group, and we're the provider of the mobile payment service that is currently live in 21 European markets. And we're trying to build a mobile payments network. And our involvement in uh, open banking, besides having a license to utilize the capabilities of the, of the European legal framework, we are aggregating bank accounts on behalf of our customers to enable them to do payments by charging their bank account using their mobile phone. So we have some insights and I'd love to, to take part in this discussion and this podcast today. Excellent. Yes. European legal framework. Those words come up a lot when we talk about Europe, you know, it's just <laughs> in Europe. Okay. And Jesus Sonoma, tell us a little bit about you. So, uh, hi guys. Uh, my name is Jesus. I lead the digital fintech team at Grant Thornton and we launched the uh, Open Finance Hub. Uh, I think that's what's relevant for this conversation. But before that, uh, I've been in banking, insurance, asset management, working on the incumbent side, build a fintech too have my scars on that end and lessons learned we can share it today. And then on the back of that, you know, I felt that uh, someone needed to be in, in between to broker these two worlds, say two different cultures coming together really to make open banking and open finance work. So I joined Grand Torto in 2019 and we decided to really be that broker, that true broker of these two worlds to drive this new ecosystem that is evolving in Europe. So for, for us, open banking is a journey that will lead from from open banking to open finance to open data economy. So that's me in a nutshell, Jason. All right, fair enough. That's, there's a lot to unpack there. So before we jump into the European experience, I just want to level set and, and set the stage. So let's define open banking. And I'm going to throw it out to whoever wants to respond first. Like, what is your definition of, of open banking for the layperson? I mean, uh, on my side, coming from, from the EU and the European perspective, where this is predominantly driven by regulation, mm -hmm. it is very specifically defined stemming from that, that piece of EU law. But I guess, I guess uh, if I were to try to define it, I would define it in, in sort of four different categories or, or verticals. So what does mm -hmm. it mean from a regulatory perspective? So, I mean, from a regulatory perspective in the EU specifically, it means a bank that operates a payment account. So like the account you get your salary to, for example, is uh, required to open up access to that account through an API for a third party to use. And through that connection, you can do predominantly two things. You can aggregate account information. So your balance, the transactions that you've done on that account and so forth. And you can do payment initiation. So to execute a payment order on your behalf. That's sort of the regulatory aspect of it. Then that plays out the way I see to, to three different uh, stakeholders. So consumers, what does it mean for you and me? Mm -hmm. So if you, if you live in the EU, it means that you can allow a third party access to your account. And so let's say you have an app that's doing payments, for example. You have an app that you really like uh, that gives you a good user experience and it has features that you like and you benefit from versus what a bank offers you. But the problem is that when that app was launched prior to PSD2 being enforced, that app couldn't access your bank account, right? So you had mm -hmm. to top up, you had to fill up, or you had to charge 
that particular service with your card with PSD2 and open banking the way it's defined by by that piece of, of legislation uh, you can directly connect that third party service to your bank account and and use a new interface to your money now for businesses what does it mean for them so if you are let's say you're an online business and today you accept payments using cards predominantly. There's obviously a whole bunch of other alternatives as well, but it's predominantly dominated by card acceptance online. So you go to the website, you enter your card information for the stuff you want to buy. If you live in the EU, you have to typically provide some sort of security element on top of that card payment, and then it goes through and it's pulled from your line of credit or your, your bank account. The problem for the business side is that accepting card payments comes at a cost. Uh, not only implementing the technology, maintaining the security standards and so forth. If you don't want to do that yourself and take the cost of that, you're paying service providers to do it for you. Like you have a Stripe account or something and accepting cards come, comes at a fairly high cost. Now, if you utilize the open banking capabilities and specifically PSD2 APIs in, in Europe, if you're a business and you have the capabilities of doing so, or you work with a payments partner that can facilitate this for you, instead of accepting cards, you can go directly to the bank account of your client and charge their bank account. What's the benefit? Well, it's free uh, compared to accepting a card payment. So that's obviously yeah. a huge incentive for the merchant side. I mean, that's that's like that's major between two to three percent of revenue on all mm-hmm. card transactions that is that is not small like you know it's it sounds like it's a small number but when you start adding it up on large enterprise levels i, I mean i don't know what the global revenue is for visa and mastercard but my goodness it is not cheap well i mean it's a great segue for maybe something we can cover later uh the visa and plaid deal so this, part, this, this 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 particular thing gives you a good good uh insight into why certain t- stakeholders in the value chain are either scared or pretend not to be scared by aggressively stepping into and trying to take control of the development in the open banking mm-hmm. ecosystem. So again, regulatory, it's requiring banks to open up bank accounts for two purposes, payment initiation and aggregation. For consumers, it means you can deal with your money through third parties in new ways that your banks was not able to or willing to do for you previously. And for businesses, it's an opportunity to charge bank accounts directly at a marginal cost compared to what you have to pay for traditional payment means. Then there's the final one. And I know this became a monologue, but it's the banks. So what does it mean for the banks, right? And equally, as we touched on with with these are the other stakeholders for the banks, it is obviously a loss of revenue, right? So it means that the, the sort of protection they had around their bank account and the direct sort of customer relationship that they had is potentially be, it gets uh, fractured. So other parties come in. So it's uh, it's a huge downfall for the banks in terms of their customer relationship, because if the consumer is using a third party's app to deal with their money or do payments or whatever it is, uh, that close relationship is challenged because mm-hmm. you would reduce the amount of time uh, that you're using in the channels provided by your yeah. bank. And we know this we know this in the Nordics because here we have mobile payment apps that are taking over and we see that the time spent in mobile banking apps, the normal mobile banking apps where you would pay your bills and check your balance is dropping like a stone. So um, I, I guess on the bank side, what we've seen is that banks have then fired up a, a bunch of different initiatives to try to position themselves. Number one, they're making their APIs hard to integrate to. That's like a first speed bump to try to reduce reduce the impact yeah. of this development or they're trying to partner with all kinds of fintechs and become that third party themselves. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so those are the four players and, and sort of how we see it playing out on our side. And I'm going to come back to the banks in a minute, but uh, let's let's go back to one important piece of information to be kind of glossed over, which is PSD2. And uh, Jesus, I'm going to give you the opportunity to talk about this one, um, but can you inform us as to what PSD2 is and what was the impact of it? I think uh, Daniel touched on, on the PSD2 quite well and the opportunity to create to create as a framework in the EU, right? You know, there's two main licenses that come out of it, AISP for account integration, PISP for payments initiation uh, providers. So there's no third party, new third party providers coming into the ecosystem to provide products and services. But I think what we do, as we explain in open banking, is critical. 
uh, for consumers and for businesses. And I think that's where we're losing uh, ourselves a lot in this. Because uh, I was listening to Daniel's explanation and then a consumer or business, who could actually know <laughs> what does this really mean to me, right? Exactly. So what we decided to do is like really distill open banking to two simple things. Uh, a lot of people will focus on the payment side of things, of course, it's about money. And of course, money could lead to a loss of revenue that, that we could discuss as well here today. Open banking, I think fundamentally is about data. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of transactional data which you can use to provide new products and services to consumers and businesses and personalize your products to them, right? And that's what open banking really means. It creates a competition, a level, level playing field in terms of information where different providers now can provide new products and services to businesses and consumers on the back of mm -hmm. their data. So uh, that's how we really summarize open bank in a nutshell. Initially, of course, it's about providing services that could be cheaper, but there are other services that could come at a premium that added value. Because as we know, some consumers uh, you know, are driven by costs, some consumers are driven by value. So mm -hmm. there's several things here at play. Yeah, and absolutely. And I'm going to go back to the bank comment earlier about, um, you know, we've, I think we've all, we've probably, probably all read the um, Copernican Revolution in Banking white paper or presentation and talking about making back banks essentially more so back end infrastructure in the future, more so than front end customer facing. When you really think about it, banking is a highly commoditized business. Like really it is, it is as commoditized as it is. Take money, leave money, pay me interest, let me give me access to it. And without the imposition of frictions, Right. They would, they're just a really utility when you really break it down to it. Like really, they're, they're really a utility. And in a lot of ways, PSD2 is, is putting them in that place of, you know what, you really are supposed to be a utility. All this differentiation you try to throw over top of it, it's just branding nonsense. Let's be honest. Maybe you throw some bells and whistles, give out some TVs, whatever it is that gets people in, in the door. But fundamentally... This data, and as depending on the nation you're in and the place you're in, a lot of times these data rights as to who owns the data of your banking information is already protected and belongs to the consumer. Right? And more often than not, these institutions, probably for well over a decade, as long as the internet's been around, have been putting up barriers to getting that. Right, And they'll say it's for security, they'll say it's for whatever else, but the reality is they'll put up barriers. And I liken it to say is like, the legislation says they can have access, we can have access to it, but it doesn't say how we can have access to it. So they're pretty much like saying, oh, you want this? Great, I just scattered a bunch of glass on the ground, go right ahead and pick it up. Go, go right ahead and cross that ground, the ground to get there. But here's the thing, let me, let me throw this question out there. Are, I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think all banks are gonna be losers in this world, right? I think that there is a opportunity for the truly innovative ones, I know it's a really funny term to use, bank and innovation, to basically embrace this and become the backbone of an entire new infrastructure we can't dream of. Like, let me throw that out there. Is that something you guys believe also, or am I completely out the lunch? No, no, you're 100% on money, Jason. Uh, but I, I think one of the, the questions that the banks have wrestled with themselves, at least in Europe, if I'm one of the biggest players, the pillar banks in Ireland, we, we have uh, two big pillar banks. I won't be naming names, but you know, people can guess who, who they are. They could look at and say, is this an opportunity or challenge for me? Is it a threat, right? If two of the banks have 75% of the market in Ireland, yeah. uh, in this case, what is the incentive to open all this data to third party providers for access? And, you know, <laughs> and provide new products and services to my clients, right? But that's why I think it's a journey because if there's an opportunity as well for the banks to start leveraging data from other ecosystems, then probably I think it's something that we should start thinking about as we discussed at EU level, open data, where they can now start leveraging data, let's say from uh, utility players and other providers, right? So they can provide new products and services and say, okay, now there's an exchange here happening whereby I can tap into other people's data and other people can tap into my data. But I think you said it quite well, Jason. You know, there have been barriers there that were put by the banks, masking on security or other things. But fundamentally, I think uh, if you're a big player, it might be more protectionist initially, right? Mm -hmm. But if you are a challenger, right? And now the challenger bank is taking a new meaning. But if you're a tier two bank, let's say, and you, you're more hungry to get into that tier one bank, you mm -hmm. will look at this as an opportunity. Now I can tap into my competitor's data and provide better products and services that are contextual and more personalized to their customers, right? And I will, I'll that. correct that. Now I'll be able to <laughs> tap into my consumer's data. Competitor <laughs> may be warehousing it, but it's the consumer's data. That's a vital difference. It, it, it could be a consumer. When, when is a consumer a consumer? When a consumer is a customer? It's a, it's a, it's a philosophical yeah. debate. <laughs> as well yeah. right yeah. <laughs> you know but that i think that's the the the, the mindset here 
And we saw in Europe that the bigger, the bigger banks didn't take that approach. They said, okay, we're going to use this as a compliance exercise. Where the tier two, tier two banks said, okay, this is an opportunity. So tier one banks kind of was a wait and see what really, really happened. Uh, but there was interesting banks, and I named these ones because I really like how they went about it. BBVA out of Spain. They really used it to transform completely their business and really put themselves in a, in a, in a position that in the next five years, they will see massive returns from uh-huh. their investment. And I'll pause here and I'll, I'll pass it to, to, to Daniel to elaborate as well. Yeah. So Daniel, I'll let you, let you jump in on that comment. Your thoughts, well, if I, ecosystem. Yeah, I, I think I want to be on the other side of the fence there to, to, to throw a bit of criticism. So to me, there is an historic element to this, which, which is very important. So... If you look at the banks from a retail and payment service perspective, so obviously they're good at lending out money, others money, Uh and they have innovated in some extent when it comes to uh, core banking systems and doing a lot of technology innovation in the core element of the services that they do. But in all fairness, these guys are spoiled and incompetent if you look back in history. So when it comes to retail and payment banking, the large player and also all the other players, because the smaller players have always been relying on the large players in terms of infrastructure access and and service rendering. I mean, that's why we have correspondent banking, because everyone is leaning on everyone to get shit done. They've been spoiled and incompetent. They had all this data all the time, right? I mean, they've been been Uh reciting on top of your habits and my habits for ages, now, because they were spoiled and incompetent, they didn't use it for anything particular that created value for us as consumers. Some of the stuff they did was later you know, deemed illegal to be done internally in the banks. And then as a result of a lot of data analysis, also by new innovators, we've gotten legislation that protects consumer rights and, and how we can use our data, specifically in Europe with GDPR, yeah, um, which, I'm a big, which I'm a big fan of. But my pointer is that the banks have this opportunity to become the insightful, intelligent, technology-driven giants if they really wanted to. But they decided to sort of stay for the most part on the I'm fat and happy side of the fence. And then some tech giants and innovators came around and created beautiful consumer experiences that had nothing to do with financial services. And what happened, the acceleration of adoption of smartphones and and general consumer in, in the population across the whole world now has sort of gone through the roof. And our appetite for more intelligent, faster, quicker, better, easier to use services is unstoppable. And this is where we sort of find ourselves in this extreme interesting dilemma where the ones that are sitting on the rails for us to transact, the ones that are sort of, I wouldn't say forced, but because of the compliance regime and the regulatory regime around providing these services, we've only had this catalog of old farts to deal with. (laughs) And then we are used to using technology. So there's this huge gap. And the regulators identify this. And I've been, I've been around looking at this for the last 15 years now, and I've seen PSD2, PSD1 or PSD, as it was called, and the start come and then go and be surpassed by PSD2. And luckily, there are some pretty clever people that works in the parliament that are trying to sort of push forward and break apart these monopoly silos uh-huh. to connect the innovation that's happening on one side with the core infrastructure on the other side. And funny enough, then, if you look at the banks, they had all the data, they had all the opportunity. And instead of developing new cool services, they actually decided to rely mostly on vendors, right? So even if you look at the whole payment infrastructure, it's Visa, MasterCard. All third party. Or, you know, it's, they didn't make it themselves. They became the staple name riding on top of everyone else's infrastructure. So what what happens? Well, the regulator comes in for the lawmakers. If you look at the first wave, so PSD1, nothing really happened. Then between PSD1 and PSD2, you got MIF. So the merchant interchange fee regulation comes in and say, okay, you're holding all the money for all the consumers and you're enabling through the Visa MasterCard network the majority of retail payments in the physical world, offline and online. And you're making a tremendous amount of money from providing virtually zero value. So how about we just cut your revenues on that to 0.2 and 0.3? The banks cry, well, it's, but you know, it forces uh, others to think differently and say, okay, are there ways we could, we could come around this and, and create new innovations? So they did. And what I'm getting to is that I feel that the banks haven't really found their place in this, right? And they still no. lean on Visa and MasterCard as the primary sort of payment rails for the majority of the retail payments. There are initiatives in the U.S. with the ACH and the, and the new uh, real-time system there. 
But, but when you look at what's happening in the market, especially in Europe as well, I mean, Visa and MasterCard are buying up anything that's closely related to account-to-account -account transaction infrastructure anyway. So Well, know. they're the biggest potential losers in all this. I mean, that's the reality of it. I mean, we can... <laughs> Yeah, we can disaggregate that. But anyway, sorry, Dan, please continue and I'll jump back into what it is. No, so I believe that there's been this sort of consumer inertia that, that we, both, we sort of become, well, we are spoiled on one side with access to technology and services and, and, and experiences from all the other vendors, but not related to our money. Because I mean, in all honesty, I like BBVA as well. And the exercise they did by buying up all the stuff in the US and creating BBVA Compass and you know their whole API strategy and being one of the first ones to adopt uh, open banking standards and pushing it hard on PSD2. I mean, look at where they are right now. Right? What has come out of that push? They're still fragmented on their API provision. They have this garden of alleged fintech partners that they're doing. They have the venture fund that hasn't really invested in anything fruitful. So the reality is that it hasn't really changed. They're still trying to figure out where they fit in. Yes, they did some technology exchange. That's great. I mean, they, they threw away some old platforms and made a new one that they also threw away. And then they bought one. And then it hasn't really changed that much besides us in the industry saying, oh, yeah, they're actually doing something, which is good. But, you know, what's the result for you and me? Well, I mean, they're the fastest moving of the slow moving herd animals, right? Like it's, it's, that's the reality. Like, yeah, you've done a great job compared to everybody else who's well, done that. The nothing. conclusion on my side is this, with the change in regulation and granting access for other players, most of the bigger guys are going to go away eventually because there's not enough room for all the big guys to be around. So we will have a couple of really big ones that yep. will be systemic banks that are, are, are holding on to the tradition of doing what banks do well. Like Apple is likely not to become a bank because they see no reason to do that when they can snare themselves on top of existing infrastructure like they do with Green Dot, right? But exactly. they will serve as you and me. There's no doubt about that. And they're yeah. already doing it. And make me so, happier than the banks would. So, so that's my prediction. Jump over to if I, if yeah, I could so. jump in there, because there's a couple yeah. of things there that I think um, just to position this back where to, to the initial question, are banks going to be going with utility, are they utilities? I don't believe, no, I don't think the banks are, they, that utility model, yes, that's what they were doing before. I think there's opportunity to become more. A lot of people are talking about lifestyle. And as you said quite well, Daniel, they have your lifestyle in your transactions. Have they capitalized on that opportunity? Not, I mean, they haven't, right? Because they, the, the model was quite profitable before. Well, right? monopolists, you know, monopolists <laughs> and oligopolies, they seek <laughs> rent. This is an economic phenomenon. They don't innovate. I mean, like, if you want to talk about what we're, what we're talking about is innovators' dilemma that goes back hundreds exactly. of years. Hundreds 100%. of years. Hundred percent, and that's why I'm I'm going, Jason. If you, that's why I gave the initial pillar banks example, right? There's no real incentive there, right? Initially to no. do this, right? But if we will step back and you know the BBVA case, BBVA looking at them, the, where they lose interest in things is actually in the developing countries. Because if you look at numbers, that's where the really opportunity is is in developing countries, right? Well, they're you know, starting from a lower they're starting from a lower start point, right? Like you you know, know, so a lot of times, where you start determines where your what technology you implement. So payment card systems in North America, QR codes in Asia, these technologies are more advanced than other ones because they they started from that point. Hundred uh, percent, Jason. And if I was a bank, if I was sitting on on this new infrastructure, we talked a lot about the rails. Do I want to be a Visa or Mastercard? No, I don't want to be a Visa or Mastercard. And you gave the example of Apple. Do I want to be a bank? No, I don't want to be a bank. This is a data game. It's, if you were just the payments infrastructure, it's commoditized. That's why Visa and Mastercard are buying everything around because they have to reinvent yeah. their model, right? When you follow the bank, I wouldn't want to be that, that commoditized business. Now I can really offer value added services. And I think the biggest, the ones that are most intelligent ones that are really shifting, because the boat, right? There's the individual that there, but there's a book that's about the legacy systems that they have to mm -hmm. transform, uh, which is not easy, right? And they have to do the, all these things in parallel. But the challenge here is for them to say, okay, where do I fit? With the data, all the data they have, if they mine it quite properly, you know, they mine it well, right? They will be able to find their way. And I think there are some interesting banks that are already doing that. You know, we're going to have now an IPO, right? Uh, we probably could name it, uh, you know, and financial, right? Oh, yeah. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> One day that'll happen. Jack doesn't hopefully, screw it up hopefully, again. Right? You know? Hopefully, um, if Jack does yeah. that might not say anything, right? That could happen. But if you look at even that model, how they really thought about financial services, right? It then it inspires you where banking could go, right? And you're right. They have no need to innovate. There's innovative dilemma. There's the profitability of the model itself. There's the barriers they've put there, you know, throughout the years. The, before you collapse all those barriers, they know they have time. 
<laughs> you know, before something gets past the EU yeah. level, it might take five to ten years to really to be fully in the market. So, so they, yeah, that's they why we will get PSD three as a result of the uh, the, uh, the barriers put in place for the RTS. I mean, we've exactly. been that's a couple of them and aggregated them. I mean, and it's that's, just ridiculous. That, you know, Danny, that's why I'm hitting that. Even even the the model we came with PSD two, the technical standards were not there. So every in the person in their own way. You know, we're looking even now how do we do authentication for for commerce business, right? Yep. You know, up to now. strong customer authentication <laughs> sounds nice and all, but when you know nobody even has control of the identity element that they're giving their clients, we're sort of far away from reaching that reality. Uh, oh, but I think yeah. I think we agree, I think we agree because bank is and will likely stay some sort of utility yeah. as a concept, right, on the infrastructure side and at the core service side, because none of the innovators Bingo. really want to replace that. There's no reason to do it because it's boring, it's expensive, it's who wants the bank mm-hmm. license? Who wants to go through that level of regulation and scrutiny? Like you don't want to multiply that effort a million times over. I mean, I look at this as the opportunity to create the AWS of financial services in every country. And those are- That's to my point, right? That's to my point is that I believe that there will be a couple of large ones. I I like the utility. If you use that that word to to the extreme (laughs) of where it comes from, you could say, you know, bank is and will be utility, which is, you know, the same as you don't really care who's producing the power, right? At the end of the day, the, the concept of electricity is a bit, you know, strange and it comes through the cable. And obviously, we want it to be green and environmentally friendly and everything. But you know, whether it's supplier A or B or C who actually well, produce the the uh, what hours well, Daniel, you're using I think right we're now. thinking about banking as binary. We're thinking about banking all the time. That is a mistake we make. We're thinking about banking all the time as money and transacting money. Mm. Bank could be way much more, and that's why I think. Uh, it all gets lost in this open banking opportunity. You're always thinking about transaction and binary in and out, but it's more than that. In my, in my I, I agree it's something else, but the question is who, right? So someone else will provide the smart lights serving you in your daily life if you know mm-hmm. someone is providing the utility. And I think that's the reality we see everywhere is that the telco was slow and old. Uh, they used to sort of dictate what mobile phone you had. The phone was branded by your telco, remember? And then all of a sudden somebody comes in and says, that's bullshit. So here's a new type of thing. And this is a beautiful device. Everyone grows addicted to it. And you fragment, right? So you leave the utility part of it, the boring part of it, which is already invested in and is there. You leave that to someone else and then somebody goes on top. And I, before you- that is an important point. I'll just, if I may. And that is an important point because that is a perfect allegory. Right, because what you're having is you're having decisions on product and service and everything made by a bunch of people who live in this one silo, who live in this one viewpoint of the world. And along comes someone else and blows that out of the water and just suddenly turns the, the shots are no longer being called by the utility provider. And in a lot of ways, that's what's happened with banking is that we have basically you look look at between banking apps around the world. Maybe some are better than others, but come on, what's the last truly innovative thing you saw in a banking app? Right. But you know what? Give just open like it's one of these things like if you just basically give them the apis a thousand flowers will bloom and we will find things that we never dreamt of and that is and we all benefit for that i think the interest of what jason you said you said that of course with the flower analogy and the bloom and that's why i think that a lot of innovation will happen on the back of this regulation mm-hmm. but also saying well, that the calls are being shot by a call now by someone else i think yes. it, there's a, there's, a, there's a fallacy here that we have to really go on and deconstruct what's happening in the market, right? If we even look at likes of successful ones, like, you know, when a trust fund Revolut, right? They have mm-hmm. challenges with their business model because if you look at the profitability, it's not there yet because they don't get into the deposits, right? And the starling of the world has started the SME space and they're based on the, their model on the core banking model, right? And mm-hmm. they've been able to say, okay, we're going to reach profitability. So the banks, to be honest, uh, they're, they're suffering now because they're seeing all the transactions going to Revolut and money feeding Revolut. But those people, day. if I may, those people have framed but, themselves as a banking alternative. Now, contemplate something that starts off as not a banking alternative and then offers that as an add-on. Think about Apple's credit card. Do I give a damn it's Goldman Sachs on the back end? No, it's a titanium Apple credit card, right? And when you, what happens when Starbucks decides that instead of giving you, you know, basically you can hold money, the deposit money you hold with them, guess what? Stars are going to start paying interest <laughs> now. Right? But Am I going to basically like? That's why I'm getting that. You have to go. Right? You have to the example of Revolut. Sorry, one uh, sec, one sec. Let's let's finish. <laughs> let, let me let, let Daniel jump in on Revolut and you can come back to my point on 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 banking not being banking. Okay. So Daniel, please. Yes, Revolut, use, using there. the example of Revolut and Monzo and and uh, you know N26 and these guys. First of all, I don't think they are good examples for what we're talking about in terms of open banking because none of them exist or. They didn't spur into life as a result of open banking in any way. That's true. Right? Yeah. It's, it's not related to that in any way. In my world, these are fancy 
pretty versions of the ugly old sister we're talking about, right? Because they're providing exactly the same thing as everyone else. Okay, the app is more beautiful. A lot prettier though. They actually have UX (laughs) designers who care about the user experience and they analyze that, but they are actually giving you an account, a means of payment. And it's basically the same as everyone else. And there are some slight differentiating. I mean, Revolut is providing a cross-border payment in in a more sexy fashion than what your correspondent bank would do. But in reality, it has nothing to do with open banking. And no, they're not profitable, but they're producing fancier app interfaces and hopefully and likely better core infrastructure. But that's not what we're trying to do. That's not what we're trying to change. I mean, the the rails underneath all of those things are more or less the same at the end of the day. And that's the concept of open banking is to give anyone who has a good idea and competence to do anything within the realm of, of regulatory frameworks the access to that old stuff, the, the big old machine that's grinding in the corner, because we don't really need to change that thing. And that's where Apple right. is, is to some extent a good example, although I don't think it's the best one. I actually have a better one, which stems from Norway. And I'm going to talk about my previous so relations I had. And I'll use this as an example, as a segue to your point about others laying on top of existing infrastructure and creating new services from that point on. So in Norway, I made mobile payments back in the days. Then I competed with the banks. I sold to the banks. The banks merged and blah, blah. Long story short, today we have a mobile payment app that's used by more than 80% of the population. It's like Venmo and Cell. It's like Alipay, but it's a domestic scheme. This has been spun out by the banks into a separate legal entity. It's owned by the bank. So it's sort of a bank. It's a very good example of banks understanding that they're basically up shit creek and they need to do something. So they took that opportunity, made that national standard. Here's a funny example, right? So they obviously have access. They don't have any RTS API implementation problems because they they get full access and everything is smooth. And they have servers. <laughs> so they aggregate bank accounts and you charge directly from your bank account and so forth. Do you know the last service that they just launched? Take a wild guess. What do you think the, the standard bank-owned mobile payment app that's used by virtually everyone in Norway just launched? Checking accounts? <laughs> I can't think of anything that backward. Go for Any, it. Uh, Jesus, you have a, have a proposition? I don't know. Instant payments, they, they should come already with it, right? Instant payments. That's why they are probably all amalgamated together to be able to Stickers. get that instant payments. <laughs> yeah. It's funny that you both, you both, you both took, a, took a stab at like a banking service. And this is yeah. my point, is that they've already nailed down the payment thing and sort of made a, made a revolution for consumers okay. and taken over the primary interface that people are using towards their money. Lucky for the banks, they own the thing. So they, they, mm-hmm. they took a step into the future and protected themselves by, by eating up their, cannibalizing their own business. They just launched a mobile subscriber, so network service, a mobile network service. So they decided to get into another utility that's highly regulated. (laughs) Well, so the the funny, and and I'm not necessarily saying that that's the best idea ever, but it's an interesting point because what they're doing is that they're saying, we have all the clients, right? We have massive distribution. We have high frequency of use. We got the eyeballs in this channel. And yes, we're dealing with people's money. And we likely see that people are paying a lot for your telco bill and we have your identity. So, you know, entering into a new contract is really easy. I think it's a good so the the concept of and, saying yeah. you can do whatever you want, right? Because you have the customer. This is what the banks didn't do the first time around. And this is one example of, you know, taking control of your daily user, your money, how you manage it. And it's basically an open banking thing because it's an overlay service that everyone is using, but you still have your money in your same bank account as before. And then all of a sudden they started telco on top. I mean, what's the next thing, right? I think it's a that's very interesting. interesting. So it's, it's, it's their version of Amazon basics, essentially. They, they, you know, that's where the money's going. Yes. All right, Jesus, uh, please jump in. <laughs> uh, the, the concept of uh, open banking, that, that's the start. It goes to open finance. And as Peak is uh, you know, very, very extensively on this, you're going to have other services like Comi Asset Management, Insurance, all these things bundled back because they see all your lifestyle in the future is about providing you those contextual products that you know, are meaningful to you and personalize that to you. We know that we park that to the very, very side and, and because that's where it's all going. Yeah, and that's why you know, the EU is actually working on that open data framework, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's all about data, really. Uh, that's what's actual data in your bank, you're opening it up. That's what open banking really is about. If we were saying that Revolut is a success, so Revolut is actually moving into that super ad framework, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Whereby they, you know, they want to provide you insurance, they're going to provide you some asset management services, be a can partner, offer themselves, they can start offering you more holistic services around your financial, but their financial yeah. supermarket, right? They can then, you know, maybe add other services outside and they're trying things in different jurisdictions around that yeah. open finance space, right? Okay, yeah. we'll talk that to the side. And then we say, okay, to ourselves, on the margin, from a consumer perspective and from 
be it a, you know, B2B or you know, direct customer, what does the customer really want? And where does the real capital really lie, right? We know is you want that money, the salary, or be it business money, really paid into that account. In order to do that, you need a banking license. <laughs> you know, we know that. Which is an obstacle. Yep. <laughs> it is a big obstacle. And Revolut now going and get, they get their banking license because they know that that's, that's what they really need, right? Because at the end of the well, day, they're moving further upstream, right? Like, I mean, once you've got you got enough, you know, you, you look what the bill is rates. that you're paying for banking services on the back end or whatever the cost is to you, you're better off at a certain point owning that owning that infrastructure. Hundred percent, Jason. So they they know they have to get some of those services in. And if I'm a customer, right? If I'm a dedicated customer, in Europe we have uh, some guarantees for banks, right? So if I get hundred, you know, if a bank fails in the morning, hundred thousand in Ireland, or probably going to go up to one hundred twenty thousand now. It's guaranteed. So if I get my wages paid into my bank and it fails in the morning, I know at least that money is guaranteed. If all these fintechs that, that I'm putting money into them, if I'm an educated customer, I know I shouldn't be putting more than 120000 into it. Well, what's interesting, that, yeah, exactly. And I, that actually came up in one of my forums the other day where someone was saying, things. yeah, like, should this I trust not, this? This is not true though, right? So I mean- um, Is it not? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, no, but it's perception. It's perception. That's the it's issue, perception. right? It's, so, so, yeah. For, I have some insights here. So I, I would argue that the the main reason that Revolut is obtaining a banking license is because that they've been challenged by the regulator. No, I'm not talking about the protection. I'm talking about the protection. Uh, the Revolut. And then, then let's forget about Revolut for that matter. Yeah, now, in terms of the protection, yes, uh, if you if yeah. you put deposit into a bank, your deposits are limited up to the ceiling of the protection from the various national yeah. or pan-European protection funds that are put in place. Which means that if you put more money in, that money is lost. Exactly. Right? Now, if you put money into, there are only two other alternative institutions, especially if we're talking about the EU, since we're talking about these two in open banking, mm. you have two other type of institutions where you can deal with your money, which is a payment institution now broken into basically the two PISP and AISP or an e-money institution, which is the only other alternative. So if you want to put money into something, there's a deposit money or whatever, there's only two, two options for you. It's an e-money institution or it's a bank. And if you put money into an e-money institution, you don't lose that money because it's client funds. It's not the protection game. You don't mix. It's not like a bank. It's actually yeah. more. It's, it's, it's a trust account. Yeah, I forget it. So I know. I, live, I, live a, I have one. <laughs> oh, oh, trust me. I, I know because I live in a country where this is a misnomer to no end, right? Like we, we, I like to say we have in Canada, we have a terrible case of Stockholm syndrome, no pun intended for the Nordic. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is, is that everyone hates our one, at least one of the banks that we deal with in, in this country loves to buy the stocks to get the dividends, but essentially also thinks that we need them because they're safe and alternatives just aren't safe. And it's like, no, safety is enforced by regulation, not by size. Like that is not a thing. I want to come back to something we talked about earlier in terms of the bank concentration and the big players. So I actually pulled up a list of the global rankings in terms of bank concentration. The lowest score, so this study measures how much market share the three biggest banks in every country have, right? So the least concentrated banking market in the world is Nepal at 17.16%. Now, not surprisingly, at 155th out of 159 is the US at 34.84. Now, that's largely because they got a highly fragmented banking system because of the way the, the, the bank acts used to work. I mean, the least one, the least, the most concentrated is, of course, Cuba, with a couple others that basically, like Iceland, where there's only three banks. And I know that because we, we all know that after what happened there. But the reality is, is that when you start looking at the average, so I'll just go somewhere up around number 75, which is mid to midpoint, you start getting into the two thirds territory. So more than 50% of, of countries have three banks controlling more than two thirds of all banking deposits, including my, my home, home country of Canada, which is sitting at 66%, something like that. So yeah, there is an enormous amount to lose for these companies if they don't move, right? Like this is, this is in a lot of ways, open banking is their bloody worst nightmare, right? Because they're sitting there, as you said, fat cats doing nothing, don't have to, you know, Visa, MasterCard, all that stuff. They could have come out with that stuff themselves a long time ago, right? And, and they didn't, they didn't. They, someone else had to come along and disrupt them. And now we're talking about what could be a, a massive fragmentation of all this. So basically let's talk about the experience in, now that I've gone on a side note, let's go back to the core of this. Let's talk about, actually, before we do that, interesting side note again, you mentioned the Plaid and uh, Visa deal. So for people who aren't familiar uh, with this, Plaid is a data aggregator out of the US. And for anyone who's ever used a system that, in Canada or the US that allows you to pull data from various banks and get one personal financial dashboard, whatever it is, they would use that. And they wouldn't use... They wouldn't use APIs. They would do something called screen scraping. So logging in with the computer and pulling that information out. And that's technically gray area legal, depending on how you look at things. 
point is, largest player in the states that was Yodely, which was on the which was the for, well, forefather. This got out by bought out by investment a long time ago, but just in the past year, Plaid, the most recent large player in the space, was bought out by Visa at a valuation that was immense. And we just happened to be recording this a couple of days after the Department of Justice announced their antitrust lawsuit against them, specifically because they have uncovered evidence that shows that the reason that Plaid was bought up at such a multiple and so quickly was because they were considering moving in, they were actually working on moving into the money movement business, a direct threat to Visa. So let's talk about the implications. So there, there, there's your evidence of people getting this, this uh, getting their getting a little bit worried about this. And let's let's get some feedback from both of you. So Daniel, I already talked to you about this. Let's let Jesus get his first go. What are your thoughts on this entire the, the, the fiasco? Thing, the thing, Jason, I think we, we live in a capitalist society, right? And I think that's why I go back to philosophy and anthropology. We have to really understand, you know, all the factors and all the forces around us. I said it even when we started the podcast in Ireland, seven, two banks, seven, over 75% of the market, right? No incentive. <laughs> it has, that's a given, right? Mm-hmm. They have a lot to, to lose with this. The plan, actually, if we step out and we say, okay, how do the tech companies operate? Yeah, because we talked about financial services, but we look at about how venture capital and tech funds really operate. Facebook has been doing this for a long while, and now we're talking about antitrust and employment competition, all this kind of stuff. Facebook was like, say, if I can only invent the next 10 years, I'm going to buy the next 10 years. That's <laughs> that's what they've been doing. Well, that's why they bought Instagram and no WhatsApp. <laughs> exactly. And if you don't sell it to me, I'm going to replicate everything you do. I'm going to put you out of business. Which is what they did to Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you yeah. know. So this is not new, right? This, this, mm-hmm. this tactic is absolutely not new. If I was a uh, visa, would I do the same? It's competition. It's capitalist society, right? If you don't come up, if you, your competitor builds something, right? They're so advanced that you want to catch up. Sometimes you just have to pay up. And, and when they said 5. 2, you know, over 5 billion, I was thinking it's cheap. It's cheap for Visa. It is actually well, on a long, long run. run a, long run, you're long absolutely run, right. A long run you're is absolutely it, right. It's cheap because if you look at WhatsApp, it's that same thing. When people, you know, WhatsApp was a billion valuation, uh, you know, people, oh Jesus, Facebook overpaid. Look at that. Now they're in here uh, with oh, payments. It's like the YouTube example America. It wasn't even you know? a billion dollars. <laughs> Right. You know, and uh, that's what I think we're getting absolutely wrong here, right? I think what, what we're getting wrong is the what society, society we live in and how we compete naturally, right? Maybe so, maybe Plot wants to be acquired. Well, they're venture capital back, so of course they want to be back. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, they, maybe they didn't want to IPO, they just maybe acquired before the yeah. IPO. Maybe some Safer. people want to IPO, right? If you build a business with venture capital, your certain purposes uh, you, you want to fulfill, right, to your investors, your stakeholders. So I think uh, the, it was no surprise for me that that was raised. And I think there'll be more of this things happening because now it's a catch up game for a lot of these players. It, it is a catch up and they have a lot to lose. It's a lot of money at play here. That, that's where we agree that, as I said, I, I think it's absolutely a catch-up game because these guys have been spoiled and incompetent and been sitting around, many of them, right? And, and, and looking at the bank's role in this. Now, I feel sorry for the banks, right? Because when you look at the, the value creation that is, or not the value creation, the, the net revenue pulled out of payments, which are controlled by a few, so let's say Visa and MasterCard as a good example mm-hmm. of what we're talking about here, when they get challenged, when the banks are forced to put something else between you and your money, right? So if, if you think about it, you keep your money with your bank and then you need an instrument to spend it with. And the, the number one instrument has been the card rails. And that has been making everyone fat and happy in, in a very clever revenue share type of setup that has created this duopoly, which is extremely hard to break. Then the regulator comes in and says, okay, let's come up with something else to force innovators access or you know, to force the, the holder of the funds, so the banks, to give the innovators access, right? To say, is there another way we could do this? Could we, and this is the good part of regulation that could be debated for ages, you know, depending on politicians' views, but, or your political views, but this is where the regulators and the lawmakers did something which is very important to do because it's sometimes big is not best, right? You need to break this apart and, and enable innovation because you can't really, you can't really come in. And I know this because I've, I've built a proprietary payment system and how hard it is to build an ecosystem that's two-sided, so to bring mm-hmm. consumers, to bring merchants in, it is virtually impossible to do. It's extremely hard, very costly, and like nobody wants this. Nobody wants to buy the first fax machine, basically, right? So it's very hard to build that network effect. So you got that right. Uh, to, to to force open these accounts is so important. Mm-hmm. Now there are a couple of problems. So number one, you see anything that sort of resembles the start of a transformative wave, whether or not that was played or not, doesn't really matter. 
but with Walker Link in the UK and with you know faster pay, the faster payment system, real time payment system sold by Nets to Mastercard. So you see the same thing happening over and over again. So the regulator comes in and say, okay, let's break this monopoly or duopoly or whatever it is apart. Let's spur up some innovation and apply some regulation that's going to make a more level playing field. And then whoever sort of sticks their head up and actually manages to get something glued together that looks promising, the big guys come in and pick it up for obvious reasons, as you said. Is just, I mean, obviously, if I were MasterCard or Visa, you know, Visa, you turn around 20 billion a year, you have 10 billion in net revenue, like a, a profit of almost 50% on the thing that you're churning out. And Insane. then somebody comes to challenge your 20 billion a year revenue machine with something you can buy for one fourth of your yearly turnover. It's like, hold on a minute. I'll just run over and, you know, fetch a, a minute person of <laughs> stuff I have laying over what, here. What's the change in the couch cushions? Let me get that <laughs> out. <laughs> <and throw it laughs> like, out. Obviously, it would do that. Now, is that good for us? Like, is it good for everyone? Yeah. What does it lead to? And, and that's the discussion that I think is important for us as industry experts and, and, and opinionated people in this uh, ecosystem to, to bring forth is that it is not, right? It, it didn't work. Because PSD2... However grand the intention is from the EU, and I salute them, right? I, I really do. I think it's a brilliant way of pushing forward innovation and breaking apart this to the benefit of consumers and businesses. And the big guys, they can afford to lose a bit, right? They've been raking in for quite a long time, but PSD2 is not cutting it, right? The RTS, the regulatory technical standard for how the API should be made, doesn't really dictate enough, right? So, we, we, Which I know because I serve a PSD2 API for certain banks. I know how they deliberately you know, try not to make it easy to use, oh, which course. is very interesting because if you do that, who are the ones that will be able to innovate? Is it the small innovative guy on the corner that has a great idea or is it the big giant? Obviously the big giant because they have the resources and money to do it. That means you, you point towards the five largest banks in the world. They can do it because they're allowed to aggregate each other. Facebook can do it. Google can obviously do it. You buy APIG and then you you know hire 60 But this 000. is a prisoner's dilemma. All it takes is one of them to break ranks and actually make it easy. And then the infrastructure that gets built on top of them, they get the first mover advantage. And everybody else, every I think it's built on them, not the other guys. And then the other this guys- This is less why scrambling. the aggregator game is so hyped in the VC world. This is why Played was bought for that multiple because you know if Visa or MasterCard didn't pick them up, then they did the, the dirty job of integrating all the shit underneath and made a beautiful RESTful JSON API on top, which would be massively dangerous for all the key stakeholders that don't Bingo. want this to happen, right? So it's the simplest thing. And I mean, that's why you have 10 of these in Europe now that are pretending to become the, yeah. the aggregator. The old GM buying the car, the guy that invented the car that runs on water. <laughs> Conspiracy. <laughs> all right. Yeah, my, so my prediction from all of this is PSD3, right? That's what we so, need. We need somebody to aggregate these APIs and make them commonly available simply so that your small fintech startup, wherever it is in the world, uh, consisting of two smart guys together that slightly can code Python, can get something rolling. That's what we need. No code. There's no code platforms. You need to code Python anymore. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's, I want to need to wrap it up. So let's wrap this up. So I was going to ask you Just before a question. Wrap it up. Just for a wrap up, just I'm gonna that. let you. I'm gonna let you say something first. So I was about to ask, what is not working and what needs to change? And you got there, okay, Daniel. So you basically said, bottom line is, as we know, you said you got to give it to us. Didn't really say how, and now we're gonna make it hard, right? So again, I just think prisoner's dilemma. Somebody breaks ranks, and somebody's gonna win that, that pot. So Jesus, what's what's not working? What needs to change? Yeah, I think uh, Daniel touched on it. That's what I was gonna say. Just before we wrap it up, because I think there's a point here that we uh, we should really give the the listeners. Regulators did a, a great job, right? Uh, because they were trying to bring competition to the market, right? If we take an Irish contest, 75% of the market, two banks, if I make it hard for anyone to innovate, they don't have access to that data, right? So it's very, very hard to innovate. But they tried, right? They, they really tried and they put the process in place. And this has been a chain of events, those GDPR first and then PSA2 and, and so forth, right? But if we look at now going forward, right? Like it's just like the sandbox happened. The sandbox first came out of the UK, the FCA, right? But it was not the best sandbox. You know, the sandboxes that in a, you know changed according mm. to jurisdiction lessons learned, right? So if we look at the regulators, they really feel that they have a competitive mandate. They approached open banking with a different mindset. Our regulator in Ireland. Personally, they don't believe they don't have a competitive mandate. I don't know the regulator is the regulator in Scandinavia if they believe they have a competitive mandate. But if we, I think we're going to cover one of in your podcast as well, Jason, uh -huh. Brazil, right? Uh -huh. Brazil, the regulator 
do believe that they have a competitive money. They have the same problem, right? You know, five banks on the, on the whole ecosystem, right? But they build, a, they said, okay, we're going to be that previous platform in-house. We're going to commoditize, commoditize across the market with picks. Uh-huh. And these are the things, that, the steps that need to be taken in order to really to drive innovation that we're talking about in open banking. Does the regulator feel that it has a competitive mandate? How do they create a, a level playing field for everyone really to innovate? And that's the key challenge. Across Europe, I think different regulators have different views of their mm-hmm. mandates in the market. Um, well, across the world, I mean, because I think the regulators <laughs> in Canada just basically said, no, we, what's wrong with five be a, a framework, right? right? <laughs> yeah. You know? But on, on that note, I think looking at Europe, uh, which is which is sort of the the, for the the front runner here, I would say. So this is mm-hmm. the value of a collaborative model, right? When when so many countries cope together and you actually form a collaborative model through whatever types of democracy you want to want to say that it is. But I mean, they've proven themselves by pushing PSD, which was PSD one. They pushed PSD two which is the reason why to long, for the majority of the conversation here has been surrounding that concept that they spurred out of PSD2. They pushed, you know, pushed the RTS, although it wasn't good enough. They pushed MIF regulation. They pushed GDPR. So they're, I have good hopes, right? I, I feel that they're, they're attacking this quite decisively and deliberately. And mm-hmm. I mean, going straight to PSD3 when they thought of PSD1, okay, they, they could have done that, but that would be very excessive. And yeah, it's incrementalism. It's got, it, it takes a while to figure out what, who's going to try to break what along the way. Right. Yeah, and the thing is that you know we have to we have to consider that they're there for the banks as well, right? I mean, the regulator is not only there for the innovators or for the consumers or for the businesses, you know, or for the yeah. banks. They're there for everyone. But, but in some countries, they're captured by the banks. But let's just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good, good point. Very, very good, good yeah. point. Just because I, I think that sometimes that's why I feel that it is very important to understand, you know, what's the regulator's mandate, right? In Brazil. They were captured by the banks, but we were like, okay, we don't want to be captured anymore. We really want to really, you know, put it up to them. And same as well in Ireland, we could say in certain jurisdictions, that we could say they capture the youth through the stats. Most of the time, three banks will have a two thirds of the market, right? So how do you really now, the, per- the person you'll be captured, or how do you release yourself from that? I think the critical thing that we have to be done, Brazil is just a model. But it's the start of that, right? The regulator really bring in some key functionalities to create a level playing field. And I would like to see that in Europe, will we say, okay, we're going to create this common platform across the whole of Europe where everyone has uh, this commoditized platform to use, right? For payments. Maybe yes, maybe no, right? But that would be interesting because EU is meant to be one body, right? So why can't we create a platform across the EU since we passport our services across, right? We're going to get there. I mean, looking Hopefully. at what's happening what's happening underneath, and I'm deep into this because we are providing services in the EU and have passported to all the EA states, and we're subject to talking to the EBA, and, and we're, we're banging our heads against challenges where banks are not giving us client accounts or custodian accounts in, in different currencies. And what is happening, if, I mean, first, you can look at the, the core infrastructure. So so step two, and, and, and so the way we're, so for SEPA, the way we're exchanging money, that's become more or less one infrastructure, right? We have a couple mm-hmm. of states left not to connect, and, you know, we do have some currencies challenges, but there is, in fact, the real infrastructure for the payment rails, and it's about to become instant as well across all participants in Europe. So that's step number oh, one. Wow. You know, step, step <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, a big statement. That's, a, that's, that's a big statement, then, yeah. Well, yeah, it's a big statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a big statement. It, it's a big statement that it takes time, but if, if you look at if you look at how the SEPA the, the SEPA network works and that it actually also includes so my country operates in Norwegian kroners, right? Where we're still part of the SEPA collaborative model and they are enforcing the SEPA ins slowly but surely. Mm-hmm. So what I was saying is that we're getting there and this concept of having one unified network and sort of one unified set of rules is going to accelerate this consolidation which is good in this perspective, right? So we're looking at the centralized account registry now, like the one we do have in Norway and we have in Croatia. We have an API driven where you can look up. I mean, look at, imagine the cost of doing AML controls, right? So you, you get a user in oh. and say, I want my money sent to this bank account. Instead of collecting so you check an API call and you get a name match and then you're done. Uh, so that's how that's how we do it, right? And, and that's that's step number one in that direction. So it's it's going to work, but... I wanted to, we're coming to the close here, I can see, but so I, <laughs> I get to leave with one interesting sort of future dilemma and question. So imagine the future where all the bank accounts are accessible through like one super smooth, easy to implement, restful API that, you know, any school kid can do with, you know, tapping and holding through their Swift coding tool. 
which means that the data that virtually anyone could aggregate would be ubiquitously available for anyone who has competence to analyze it, which in turn means that whoever you're dealing with would know the prices of everything you're buying, right? And all your habits. Just imagine who is going to make money doing retail and trade when everything that everyone buys is more or less predictable and the pricing of the products, because that's the key That's a key feature that I would be looking for, right? I'm not buying bespoke handmade furniture every day, but I'm buying all kinds of standardized mass-produced shit all the time, right? We all do. Yep. And we're becoming this homogeneous group of people who wants the same stuff all the time. And I showed you my headset when we started this thing. And you said, ooh, yep. that's interesting. <laughs> uh, so where to get that at the cheapest price right now? I mean, that's an obvious outtake of having the ability to analyze all of this data. Then the, yep. that, like everyone will be shopping from Amazon because it's only it's the same it's the same uh, um, centralization yeah. that will happen, right? Because potentially the local store can't make any money out of selling it expensive, right? Well, the that's, local that's, store can can find different ways to monetize with data. But anyway, that's a different story. Like Azu's final thoughts, and we gotta go. No, on, the, on that one, uh, Daniel, I think you're dead right. I think uh, the interesting companies that are looking into this space in open banking and open finance and open data are looking at the element of behavioral science, behavioral banking. Mm-hmm. And that's what we're advising our clients on is really behavioral science, really going into predicting behaviors, predicting de- customer patterns, right? And you need more data to be able to get to precise predictions, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's why I think the likes of the big players were coming in, the big tech coming in, they say, there's the opportunity now, we have the data, we have the algorithms, we have the capacity, we have the brains, now we just open us the transactional data and let us play with it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and well, I think... And I, I think totally agree, and, and, and we are actually doing that. That's one of the reasons why we're in this game, because we believe it's very powerful. I want to wanna throw some cold water before we end. So the problem is... Here, that, we got 10 seconds. Let's go. <laughs> also, also, We're not gonna leave. We're not gonna leave the book. <laughs> it's great. No kidding. We can go on for most an hour. Of the, most of the retail payments that we do out there are done with cards. When you pay with your cards, the amount of data you get in return is nothing, right? So the cards doesn't know line item details of what you're purchasing. So even yeah. the you know the, the the promise of analyzing your transaction history the way it exists inside the bank today only got, gets you so far. This is why. The super apps are dangerous. This is why what we do is dangerous and what Alipay is doing is dangerous because you're building your own merchant ecosystem where you actually know what people buy because you control the line item data. Yep, that's true. Uh, uh, Even on that, and, you know, just uh, just a park of thoughts, you know, and people are, people, are doing, <laughs> people are doing this with already insurers with, uh, you know, they give you the Apple Watch and they pay you, your data pays for your Apple Watch, right? In the yep. future, they will pay you for your, for your transactions, right? They'll pay you for, to be a, a customer. But in <laughs> fairness, good, because we're getting hosed. Like we're giving up all kinds of free resources everywhere we go and we get nothing for it. Well, we get some free apps, but like still, anyway, gentlemen. We could probably talk for another hour and keep this going, but this is fantastic. I thank you both for your time. And uh, yes, take care. Super, Jason. It's been a pleasure to be here. This is fantastic. So that was the first of several open banking conversations, uh, specifically in this case uh, with the EU and with Daniel and Jesus, which I think if you heard how excitable we got throughout this entire thing, I think that, that podcast could have gone for three, four, five hours without us slowing down. As you can see, I hope after this podcast, you have a better idea in general of what open banking is, where the potential lies and what the EU has done in order to do to support that. And it'll be a very interesting contrast between the EU, the US, Canada, and this everywhere else in the world and working across borders, which I'm going to hopefully bring to you over the next couple of podcasts. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever your podcast. And until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, 